So welcome to the 8th uh, lecture on energy and finance, so uh, again on real options, but now we'll go to real options in continuous time. So last time uh, we saw that uh, if you have an investment project uh, in which you uh, can invest to get some value, which depends on some price, <clears throat> which might be uh, moving up and down in the future, then it might actually pay to wait doing the investment. And the reason is there is some real option value there. So if you wait, you uh, will see whether the price will go up or down, perhaps. Well, if price goes down, you might be happy not to have invested uh, beforehand. While if price goes up, you might actually want to make the investment. So this asymmetry actually creates might create some option value. Uh, and then we wondered, so how shall we value this opportunity to invest? And we introduced basically the Bellman equation there. So this Bellman equation says... Well, what's the value of making this investment? Well, it depends on today's price, of course. So for a higher price, probably we're more, we'll be more likely to make this investment today. But what, in fact, we'll be doing, we'll, at each moment in time, so at each time step t, we'll be comparing what is the value that we get if we invest right now. So that's the NPV, essentially. And let's compare this with, well, what happens if we wait one time step? So in that case, we'll have nothing this time step, of course, but next period, t plus 1, will again have an option in which we can again make this, this um, assessment, do we want to invest at that moment or not? So again, we will have the, an option value at one period later, so we have to discount this. Um, and at that moment, we will again make this optimal decision, yes or no, in, uh, investment in the, at that period. So this Bellman equation essentially relates the price of the option today to the price of the option uh, next period, tomorrow, if you wish, at period t plus 1. And sometimes you can actually use that relation between prices to the price of the option, option value today to the option value tomorrow to actually deduce what this value function actually looks like. Now, often actually in this, in this discrete time framework, uh, that's fairly difficult. Uh, and that's actually why today we are going to work in continuous time. Because in continuous time, sometimes it's actually turned out to be easier to precisely solve for this, for the option value V, which is a function of the price P, um, which, did, which um, uh, determines, uh, which satisfies basically this Bellman equation. So let's have a look at uh, what, what we'll do today. So we look at valuation in continuous time, right? So this P, rather than making steps up and down, uh, we'll have to assume some continuous process for this price P, for this price process. And the process that we'll work with most, if not all of the time during this course, is going to be the process of geometrical Brownian motion. And the main reason for that is because that's the most tractable one. Um, so what it what, you know, what this is again, so the, it basically describes the price in terms of some drift parameter mu and some volatility parameter sigma. And this price is going to move up and down in some stochastic way, but with some predictable uh, growth rate mu. So then we'll have a look at what the Bellman equation looks like in continuous time. So we're going to, to um, make the um, approximate, well, we're going to take the, the limit basically in which the time steps are going to get closer and closer until we get that continuous time and I'll have a look at what this Bellman equation will look like in that case. And it turns out that this equivalent of the Bellman equation that we looked at in, in this discrete time environment last time will turn out to be uh, some differential equation that should be satisfied by this value function V of P. So we'll find out what that equation is and then we'll go on to actually solve that equation. In terms of literature, so what we're going to do is mainly described in this book, this book by Dixit and Pindic, uh, in chapter 5 and also at the beginning of, of chapter 6. So have a look at that uh, as well. So just to have a brief preview of what we'll find uh, today is, um, well, it's the following, it's basically summarized in, in this picture and the next. So this blue line here is obviously something which is uh, moving up and down in stochastic fashion and uncertain fashion, so that's the price, the price is, is moving, and it's going to turn out that it's going to be optimal to make the investment as soon as the price 
passes some particular threshold. So we call this threshold here P star, and it's given by this, this red dashed line. So what will turn out to happen is that if prices today is fairly low, we should wait. We should not invest. So there's more option value in waiting than there is in getting the investment right now. So at some point when this blue line passes the threshold, crosses the threshold P star, then it will be optimal to actually exercise this option to, to make the investment. And what is what's left to us basically is to determine where is this threshold, where is P star, and what is actually the option value whilst we have not yet reached that threshold. So that's what we're going to, to do. So what does this option value is going to look like is the following. So again, uh, so what, what this is on the horizontal axis is now this, uh, this price P. Uh, P star, as you can see down there, is, uh, is the value at which we want to make this investment. So this investment threshold. And what V is, is the value of this project. So if P is really large and we would like to invest right away, we immediately get the, um, the MPV of this project, which is the, the value of the discounted cash flow in the future minus the investment value. So that's this, this, this dash line over here. What this blue line represents is you know, when this price is still below P star, so the left of this P star, it turns out to be more valuable to have the option alive, and that value is actually represented by the blue line, so that's the option value, than the value that we get if we immediately exercise, which is this dashed red line. So in that case, we only get the MPV. So in this area here between 0 and P star, the option to wait is worth more than the immediate value of, of investing uh, right at that moment. So and we'll figure out you know, what's the... Uh, the exact form of this blue line and where is this P star. So that's the task that's upon us for today. So what will we do today? So again, continuous times. First uh, part that we're going to look at, then I'll, I'll reintroduce uh, the geometric Brownian motion, which you've seen uh, at some point before. And what we're then going to work on is you know, what does this Bellman equation actually look like and how can we interpret it in continuous time. And once we've done that, we will also have a look at how to solve that equation. We're going to, to use that then in looking at um, investment timing. Uh, so we're going to look at an actual at a, at a toy model of an investment project and figure out you know, what's this P star, what's this investment threshold, and what's actually the value of this of this real option V as a function of P. How can we refine that? So let's then first go to, uh, to the continuous time uh, framework. So what we want to do is, instead of having these revenues P each time step, so today an income P, tomorrow an income P, the day after tomorrow an income P, with this P being uncertain, jumping up and down each period with some probability. So we have this binomial tree process, if you remember. So instead of that, so that's a discrete framework, we go to a continuous framework. So in a continuous framework, with the time flows in a continuous manner, P is also going to uh, move continuously, and P will actually be a flow of revenues. So rather than saying we get a fixed amount of euros per day, say, we get a flow of euros per time unit. So um, for a second, we get P times DT, where DT would be a second and P me measures basically the intensity in which money is flowing in during that second and the next second this P might have uh, changed a bit already a slight little bit and again in the next second we will get the flow rate times the time interval DT the next second um, so that's a fl flows that we will have to look at we also have to in order to go to continuous time we have to look at uh, discounting continuous time. So what we'll do is we'll use a discount factor with continuous components, so that makes sense in conti continuous time. And as you probably know, or otherwise I'm just introducing that now, instead of using this discount factor, which is uh, discounting with, with given time units, a unit per money, the annual interest rate, the annual compounding, instead of that we go to the discount rate with continuous dis uh, discounting, with com uh, continuous compounding, and that uh, takes that really takes this particular form. That's, that's just essentially again a choice to make life more convenient in uh, continuous time. So again, this is a number that's typically slightly lower than uh, than one, but above zero. So it's 
it's like a discount factor. And um, this R again is this interest rate with continuous compounding. And T is of course the, the time. So we need to figure out you know, with this continuous compounding what's the present value of some cash flows. And particularly we would like to first see again this easiest example essentially. What's the present value if we get a fixed flow? So it's not uncertain here, it's just fixed for all time, but it's a flow now of profits. So what's the present value of such a flow, a constant flow of profits, where this flow equals the size P. So in order to compute that, we have to add up basically the flow over all times from now to infinity. So by adding up in continuous time, means taking the interval, right? Integration is basically adding up the, with arbitrarily small time steps. So each of these time steps will get this amount of money P times DT, right? So this amount of money that we get is proportional to the amount of time that we wait. And the intensity of this flow here is P, it's profit flow. And we have to do this discounting, so that accounts for this discount factor e to the power minus rt. So the further, the larger t is, uh, the lower this e to the minus rt becomes, uh, because we're discounting something, which a cash flow which occurs in the future. So we have to compute this integral. So let's let's actually compute this. So let me do that on uh, on paper just to remind you how to compute an integral. And this is of course a fairly easy uh, integral to compute. But let me do it anyway. Um, so we have uh, the value, and it's going to be the value that derives from um, these cash flows, which run from t equals zero to t equals infinity. So it's a perpetuity, if you wish. Again, we have to do this discounting. So this discount factor was e to the minus r t, where r is the uh, the, 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 uh, the interest rate, the discount rate, and t is time again. What do we get each period? Well, P is the flow and the period lost in DT. So P times DT basically is the amount of money that we get uh, each very small interval DT. So let's do this integral. So how again do we do an integral? Well, you figure out, so this P is a constant here, right? So it doesn't depend on T, so the only position in which T appears. And this is, so this is an integral over time, actually. So this is the only function of time here is this discount factor e to the power of minus rt. So what do you, how, do you draw, how do you compute an in integral? Well, you figure out what's the uh, indefinite integral here, so of, of this function. And if you think a little bit, you'll figure out it's actually going to be of this form, minus r. So why is this the indefinite integral of this function, e to the minus rt p? Well, because if we take the time derivative of this expression here, so all these, this P and the R, they are just constant, so they do not depend on time, but there's time here, and so if you take the derivative here, well, let's do that with an exponential. If you take the derivative of that, it's basically the exponential itself, but multiplied by this minus R, which multiplies the T. So if you take the uh, Derivative, this minus r comes down, it cancels with this minus and with this r in the denominator. So it gives us, taking the derivative will again exactly give us this function e to the minus rt times p. So that, that's what makes an indefinite integral. So it's the object, the function, which if you take the derivative leads back to this expression which here under the integral sign. And what do we have to do if we take the definite integral between these two uh, time uh, periods, let me just put it in uh, square brackets actually, the normal notation here. We take this between these two boundaries, so t equals zero and t equals infinite. And what that means is, well, you first plug in the, the upper value, the upper boundary at t equals infinite. Well, what happens, you plug it in in this expression here for the indefinite integral. So t equals infinity, well e to the power minus something times infinity is going to be zero. So this first expression plugging in t equals infinity gives zero. I have to subtract from that the same thing, but now plugging in t equals zero. So minus minus p times e to the minus r times zero divided by r. So minus times minus makes a plus. So in the end, and e to the minus r times 0, or e to the power 0 equals 1. 
So this is exactly p to the power r. So this is the value of a perpetuity in continuous time, and actually it's the same as the value that we found in uh, inappropriate units in the uh, discrete time framework. So let's go back to uh, the slide. So there we are, and indeed here we see the same computation uh, rebound on this slide. So that's the value of a fixed flow of profits or a perpetuity in continuous time. Um, so that's what we do. We do integration essentially to compute uh, the adding up of lots of future values. Let's look at the next simplest example, which is the present value of a growing perpetuity, so a growing flow of profits. So let's assume that this P is now not constant, this, this profit uh, process it's not constant, but it's gr growing at some constant growth rate. So it's still deterministic, so there's no uncertainty there, but it is growing. So what, what would that amount to? Well, this P is going to grow exponentially uh, with time and with this growth rate mu. So e to the mu times t times its starting value P at uh, period zero. So again, we have to uh, compute this interval, so let's do that uh, as well. Let's again go to paper here, so the growing perpetuity a growing perpetuity so P as a function of T is now growing with this growth rate growth rate mu times its starting value, so at T equals 0 this, grow, this factor here is 1, so that's P0 itself but as time progresses, it's going to go up in an exponential way. So what's the value of this thing? Okay, let's plug it in. We have to again add up from time equal 0 to time equal infinity. We have to discount to the power minus RT and then plug in this P of T. So this growing profit process. So let's plug that in. E to the power mu T times P at this time. So, and I have to integrate this. So can we again do this um, integral? Well, yeah, of course. So what we need to do is to have to recognize that if we multiply these exponentials, it's going to be e to the power minus r plus mu, if you wish, d times b dt. So now it looks a lot again like what we had before, except instead of the minus r, we now have minus r plus mu. So this uh, expression that we, uh, this computation that we did is going to be completely similar to what we did before, but now of course the uh, r is actually going to be replaced by r minus mu. So note that this of course only makes sense as long as mu is smaller than r. So if, if mu is bigger than r, so p grows at a rate which is larger than the discount rate, well, then that perpetuity, which a growing perpetuity, which grows faster than the interest rate, that's, you know, the, the, the growth rate actually outpaces the discounting. So that gives rise to an infinite amount of cash flows, which grow bigger and bigger, even in present value. So those will add up to infinity. So that's that actually does not make sense. So that cannot exist, actually, because it would be arbitrary the way. So P over R minus mu will be the value of this growing perpetuity with mu, uh, the growth rate, which should be smaller than R for this whole problem to make sense. Okay, so let's go back to the slide. So here we see this again happening. So uh, I already wrote here this, uh, multiply those two exponentials. Uh, and then we did the integral, integral and to get P divided by R minus mu. And again, this looks a lot like actually, yeah. Uh, what we saw uh, with uh, in, in discrete time. Okay, so ne let's next go to uh, to introduce uncertainty here, and we'll do that by discussing geometric Brownian motion. But let's do that in the next uh, video.